Good morning, everyone, and thank you for tuning in again this week. We do appreciate you being with us. This current teaching series is about removing obstacles or rocks that limit God's power in our lives. It, it's to remind us of the people God has called us to be, hence naturally supernatural. Now, each one of these rocks, and John spoke of disappointment and Francis spoke about the rock of unbelief, each one affects our relationship with God. Please, I ask you, don't underestimate this. Uh, each rock has the capacity to diminish our vision and not only diminish it, but distort our vision of who God is. So today I'm speaking about the rock of self-reliance. And we're gonna to go to Matthew chapter seven, and we're gonna read from verses seven to 11. And I'm gonna read this passage and a little bit later, we'll come back to it. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you're evil, know how to good give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good, good gifts to those who ask him? In my very early 20s, I, I hadn't been a Christian for very long, possibly about a year, and, um, and then I fell away. I, I fell away from the Christian faith and I have to say, it didn't happen in an instant. It was little by little. I started spending less time with my Christian friends. Um, church became sporadic. Eventually it stopped. My lifestyle changed. My friendships changed. And then four years later, by God's grace, I came back to the Lord. Now, during that time, I did things that I thought I would never do. I mean, previously I had, I had lines of lifestyle which I never crossed. I found during that time, I crossed many of them. And in all that time away, I could never deny God's existence and the truth of Jesus Christ. In fact, when I proposed to Des, which I remember was at a very romantic setting of a bus stop, uh, I said, will you marry me? But I'm going to be a Christian one day. And in truth, I already was, but I certainly wasn't living like one. And throughout those four years, I always wanted to come back home. And when Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15, who finally comes home, in the story, the father calls for a feast. And then he says, this son of mine was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. And it's that last phrase was lost. That was me, lost. And I, I knew that experience because I had the same experience before I became a Christian. That sense of being lost, not knowing where I belonged, a young man without roots. And I want to pick up on the effects of that sense of being lost by looking at the roots of self-reliance this morning. And then I want to talk about the heart of prayer. Now, In a passage we read earlier, Jesus is talking about a relationship with the Father. It's part of what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. You'll find it in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And what you notice is that throughout the message, Jesus is constantly directing people to the Father. So when he talks about giving in secret, he says, then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And then he says, uh, when you pray, what do you say? Well, of course, our Father. And when you fast, Jesus said, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others, but only to your Father who is unseen. Do not worry, Jesus said, saying, what should we eat or what should we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your fa heavenly Father knows what you need. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father 
in heaven. I mean, time and again, Jesus points to the Father. When Jesus fed the 5,000, he took the five loaves and two fish, looked up to heaven, gave thanks, and broke them. When dealing with a boy who was deaf and had speech problems, he did exactly the same, looking up to heaven. He sighed. Ephrathah, he said, which means be opened. And the boy's ears were opened and his tongue was released and he spoke plainly. Jesus is constantly directing people to the Father. Now, even though many Christians know this, they often function as orphans. And self-reliance is rooted in a heart that sees itself being alone in the world. It assumes that the working out of their life is down to them. And in his book, Sustainable Power, Simon Holly lists a number of orphan symptoms. Now, he's not the only author to have done this. A number of authors have done this. And, uh, and he said that for, for many people, their view of God is seen through the lens of their relationship with their earthly father. I have to say, I've had numerous conversations with Christians struggling with the truth of God as their father because of their experiences of their own father. Uh, one lady, I recall, had been a Christian for many years, and she found this to be a huge hurdle to overcome. And many others have been there too. The great reformer, Martin Luther, who had immense biblical knowledge and theological understanding, is alleged to have said, I have difficulty praying the Lord's Prayer because whenever I say our Father, I think of my own Father, who was hard, unyielding, relentless. Now, I'm a father too, so I'm going to pick up that whole matter of earthly fathers in a moment. But first, these wounds can distort our view of God as father. And there, I'm just going to outline a couple of symptoms. Orphans see God as one who loves conditionally, you know, is based on one's performance. But the father loved us before we were created. And even when we were lost in sin, because Romans 5 verse 8 says, but God shows his love for us, that whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The, the performance trap is one that Christians fall into time and time again. And I, I recall during those four years of being away from God, one of the things I would say is, I'll come back to God when I've got my life straightened out. But I, 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 I didn't want to owe God. I wanted to prove that I could manage myself, in which case, why would I need him anyway? Now, self-reliance is a, is a blockage. It's a blockage to God working in you and a God working through you. It's epidemic in our culture. You know, the number one favorite song at funerals, and probably some of you know this, it's I Did It My Way by Frank Sinatra. So the irony was that I was completely ruling out the gospel of grace. That the gospel is grace, which means unmerited favor, by the way. You know, by grace you've been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now, let me ask the question. Is this how you see God? Is it all down to your performance? Church leaders can be prone to this too. Um, their feelings of encouragement or discouragement can rise and fall based on perceived success of their church, you know, validated by numbers or small group commitment. I have to say I've more than dipped my toes in the water on this one. We live in an ultra performance orientated culture. Christians, your value, your worth, it's not measured by the things you've done and how you've done them. If that was so, you, you're going to miss the extravagance of God's love for you. You know, sometimes his love, it catches you so wonderfully unaware. And you need to be loved just for you. But you can miss this if you're wondering whether today do I merit his love? Tomorrow will I merit his love? You know, that, that Jesus came for you and me and died on a cross for our sins. That's our value not our performance. Now, another symptom is that orphans see 
God sets an unreasonable standard. You know, and he's harsh and critical, especially when we miss it. But the father is compassionate to his children. <laughs> he knows that they are frail and they fail. In uh, Paul's letter to the church of Corinth, second letter, he starts like this. He said, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of mercies and God of all comfort. You know, to speak of the Father of mercies means compassion is at the very heart of God. It's the river that runs through the heart of the Father. I mean, he is the one who multiplies mercies to his wayward, messy, fallen people. It's a multitude of mercies. It's a, if your heart is hard, his mercies are tender. He isn't cautious, by the way, with his tenderness towards you. If your heart is dead, his mercy to make it alive again. If you are sinful, he has mercies to sanctify you and cleanse you. Dane Ortlund um, is an author and he writes, your gentlest treatment of yourself is less gentle than the way the father handles you. Jesus offered mercy to the woman called in adultery. The Pharisees had judgment on the menu. It's a lie to see God as harsh and critical. Listen, Christians, don't fall for that one. Is he aloof and cold? No. We read that when Jesus saw the crowd, he had compassion on them. I, I tell you, I am so thankful for his mercy. An orphan spirit struggles to receive good things because they don't know if they deserve it. An orphan spirit at its most basic level assumes that life actually is down to them. Now, this is a huge obstacle, self-reliance. Are you living like that? Simon Holly records a, he recalls a visit to a church. He noticed an older gentleman and a boy about 13. The boy had severe cerebral palsy. He was sitting in a chair with head restraints. He said, and they, they all stood to sing and began to worship. And uh, this is what Simon writes. He says, about halfway through, I sat down. And as I did so, I noticed that the boy, that the, that the man had lifted the boy onto his lap and was cradling in his arms, and the boy's head on his shoulders. And he was looking right in the boy's eyes, his face only inches away. And as he held him, rocking backwards and forwards, I could clearly hear what he was saying. Over and over, he was telling the boy, God loves you, and I love you. You're a really special boy. God loves you, and I love you. You're a really special boy. The boy could do nothing, not even stop the dribble running down his chin. And as I watched this scene, I was overcome with emotion and began to weep. I saw in an instant a picture of the unconditional love of God. I really could do nothing for him or anything of account for myself. Yet he loved me. I was special to him. The tears came like a flood as years of orphan thinking began to be stripped away from my heart. Well, that's a very moving account. And my friends, if you're in that situation I, uh, of, a, of an orphan heart, I, I want the same for you. I, I want you to step away from living like an orphan and step into living as a son or a daughter of your Father in heaven. Your view of God as your Father will determine everything about your relationship with him. This week, I'm asking you, take time out. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal any rocks of self-reliance in your life and ask him to bring a fresh revelation of the truth of the Father's love for you. Your view of God 
as your father will determine everything about your relationship with him. Christians, this is hugely important to your life. And that leads me to my second point. The heart of prayer is relationship. It's not about the right words. It's about a relationship, father to a child. You don't have to be eloquent. A little child doesn't walk into a room where his or her father is and wonder, hmm, how am I going to say this? They just say it. They say it as it is. They're not even contemplating whether you're interested or not. Now, I, I know there are some negatives around God as Father. And now I'll come, I'm coming to this now. So, some people have experienced fathers that were distant or demanding, demoralizing, even absent, uh, even worse, abusive. Listen, God is unlike any father on earth. Every dad is flawed. Every dad is imperfect. Every dad makes mistakes. My kids will tell you that. Our father in heaven is never moody. He's never inconsistent. He, he's always patient. He always loves you. He is absolutely perfect. He understands you. You know, my dad didn't always understand me. But then when I think about it, I don't think I even understood myself at times. God knows what you think more than you know what you think. The blueprint for fatherhood is in the Bible here. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In the earlier reading, Jesus specifically tells us how to pray. Uh, not only what to say, but how to pray. you got to get it, you see. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Jesus said, ask. And look how confident, confident this is. Ask. I mean, he, the Father's close to you all the time. Ask. Well, sometimes we, we feel there's a distance. Seek. Well, what am I seeking for? I'm seeking to ask, of course. Knock. You know, sometimes... There's a barrier. Knock. What for? To get to the place where you ask. Have you noticed children are really good at this? Dad, can I have? Mom, can I have? Dad, I want. Mom, I want. You know, I, sometimes it's just relentless. Some of you need breakthroughs in your asking. You need breakthroughs in your finances. I'm saying, come on, ask. Some of you need breakthrough in your health. Ask. And you may have asked before, but the essence of this is to keep asking. Uh, some of you need breakthroughs for those you're praying for. Ask. Look, how it all works out isn't down to you and me. Your Father in heaven knows best. He will not give you anything that is harmful. He will not give you anything that is worthless. Why? Because your Father in heaven gives good gifts. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask? So ask. Lean into your heavenly Father. You know, many years ago, I, I uh, made some notes in my journal of the things that I prayed for. And, and some of the things were specific and and, and some of them were just little matters, and some of them were big concerns. And I, I did this, for, I think it was probably for a couple of months. And then when I look back, I realized how unaware I was of so many prayers answered. It, it was a real surprise to me. Christians, ask. You know, the more you get into the habit of talking to God, the more you discover not just what is on your heart, but what is on his too. Prayer is talking to God. And the other day I'm walking along the road to the shops and there are hedges between uh, people's gardens and the pavement I'm walking on. And I'm talking. I'm talking out loud to the Lord about 
all manner of things. And I, as I'm talking to him, you know, things are coming into my mind about it would be good if I contacted this person or if I rang that person, had I thought about this. And, and then a thought struck me is that, do you know, if anybody's on the other side of the hedge, they'll think that guy's a little strange. But anyway, I'm talking to him. It's a relationship. God's not a vending machine where I put in my prayer allowance and get a response. No, he's my father in heaven. Prayer that was, was a constant flow in Jesus's life. You can't miss it. The disciples didn't. Much prayer, much power. That's why the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray. Much prayer, much power. Little prayer, little power. It comes out of relationship. You know, on an Alpha course, one of those on the course said to me after three weeks, they said, I came because I wanted to know and learn more about Christianity. He said, I now realize it's about a relationship. And part of that may well have been because they heard us pray, because we would pray for them. The heart of prayer is relationship. Lean on him. You know, when people hear you pray, they realize you're not speaking words into a void, but that you're praying to a person, your Father in heaven. They hear genuine, heartfelt prayers to God. And for many, this is an absolute eye-opener. They haven't heard people pray like this. You know, to hear you pray to God so personally, I mean, it's a real surprise. They know you're not merely going through the, the motions, you know, prayer. No, they can see it's absolutely relational. Be intentional. Lean on him. George Muller is an amazing man of faith, fed hundreds of orphans. Now, one day he came downstairs, there was, there was no breakfast in the house, 300 children to feed. And so he called the children to pray. And as they prayed, there was a knock at the door. The milkman is there. And he says his cart has broken down. I've got no use for the milk. It's going to go off. Can you use it? Then, shortly after that, the baker arrives. He knocks on the door. He said, I've got bread here because God woke me up at two o'clock this morning telling me that you would need loaves for breakfast. You know, the important thing to see is that when Muller came down the stairs and called the children to pray. He said, let's see what God will do. And this week, here's the, th here, here's the challenge. Let's look and pray for an opportunity to pray for someone in person. Someone perhaps who's not a Christian. Perhaps someone in your family in person. Perhaps a friend, perhaps somebody at work. Uh, people don't mind being prayed for in general. So, and then it gives them an opportunity to realize how valued they are to you and how personal your relationship with the Father is. And let's see what God will do. Now, as we finish, I want to take a moment to, to reflect. Uh, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit or just where you are to reveal any rocks of self-reliance in your life. And I'm going to ask him to bring a fresh revelation of the truth of the Father's love for you.
let's pray together.